And with that, I'd like to introduce Ken. All right, take it away, Ken. All right, hello. Thank you very much for uh, having me here today to talk about uh, the new stormwater permit uh, and the BMP design manual. Sorry, I'm not used to using a microphone. Let me know if it gets too, too quiet or too loud. Um, so as Jackie mentioned, uh, I've been with Fusco for about 12 years now, and uh, over that time, uh, stormwater requirements have changed quite a bit, and it's become a bigger and bigger part of what we do uh, as civil engineers at Fusco Engineering. And I'm sure it's become a bigger and bigger part of what you guys do as uh, landscape architects. Um, some of these um, stormwater treatment facilities are, are uh, part of the, the landscape as well. Um, so today I'll be talking about uh, the latest generation of uh, stormwater requirements um, and how that will impact uh, future projects. So here's a quick overview of what, uh, what I'll be talking about today. Um, first off, what are the MS4 permit or the stormwater permit uh, and the BMP design manual? Um, then I'll talk about some of the major changes uh, in these documents from previous regulations. Those, uh, well, there's several changes, but the main categories are in, under uh, water quality treatment and uh, hydro modification. Um, and then we'll talk about how these changes might affect uh, upcoming projects and then offer some solutions and planning tips uh, for when you're looking at new projects um, and how to integrate uh, these stormwater requirements into the project design. Uh, so uh, the stormwater permit or the MS4 permit uh, is issued by the Regional Water Quality Control Board. Uh, so the state of California is split up into regional water quality control boards. Um, we're in region nine, which covers uh, most of San Diego County, basically San Diego County from the ridgeline of the mountains to the west. And then also portions of Southern Orange County and Southern Riverside County. Now the MS4 permit stands for Municipal Separate Storm Sewer Systems. So it's an M and then four S's. Um, it's also sometimes referred to as the stormwater permit. And so this is a permit that the regional board issues to the county and the cities within uh, the region. Um, and it allows them to discharge from their municipal stormwater systems uh, into the waters of the state. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt, but it turns out we've got an overflow crowd. So we need the people on the side there to please exit. They're going to open the doors in the back so that we can accommodate everyone. And I do apologize for the interruption. Um, it'll be noisy for a few minutes. I don't know if you want to just um, Yeah, I'll, I'll keep going um, in the interest of time. Um, but let me know if you can't hear, um, and I'll speak up. Um, and so previous uh, MS4 permits, um, so the MS4 permits are renewed every five to six years. Uh, the latest one was adopted in June of 2013. Um, and it covers all of Region 9. Previously, the, the different counties within the region had been on separate permits, but um, this one includes the San Diego County, Southern Orange County, and Southern Riverside County as well. Um, and you may be wondering, well, if it was adopted in June of 2013, why are we still talking about it? Um, well, the, the permit had a, a timeline for implementation that included uh, that, in, that outlined some documents that needed to be prepared for the uh, uh, to be implemented, and that includes some, something called water quality improvement plans uh, that were looked at each watershed to determine the, um, the highest priority water quality concerns for those watersheds, uh, and a document called the watershed management area analysis, and also the BMP design manual. Now, the BMP design manual is what we use as civil engineers to uh, design our, our projects <coughs> to comply with, uh, with the terms of the permit. So that's the, kind of the most important document for us as civil engineers, um, and that kind of trickles down to um, uh, landscape uh, as well uh, for that, those areas of overlap. Um, and so the, per the timeline outlined in the permit and following an amendment, um, the BMP design manual uh, was implemented in February of 2016. Uh, so just last month, um, on the either 16th or the 26th, depending on your jurisdiction. Um, and the BMP requirements, um, um, <laughs> and the BMP requirements uh, in the BMP design manual uh, primarily uh, apply to priority development projects. And so I'll talk a little bit more about what those are. Uh, is that better? <laughs> Uh, 
No? OK. I'll just lean over. That's OK. <laughs> um, so uh, one of the first questions uh, we're asked by, by clients and developers uh, when there's a new requirements going into effect is, well, can my project be grandfathered under the old requirements? Um, so to talk a little bit about uh, grandfathering, um, the, uh, the, the permit originally didn't include a clear definition on what projects would be grandfathered. Uh, but through uh, a series of workshops and an uh, amendment to the permit, um, a definition was included in, into the permit. Um, and so the, the permit refers to grandfathering as prior lawful approval. So in order to be grandfathered uh, under the old requirements, your project had to have prior lawful approval before the effective date of the BMP design manual. And so that effective date is uh, February of 2016. Um, and so in order to get prior lawful, to, to qualify for prior lawful approval, you, the projects had to meet a couple of uh, requirements. Uh, and those include uh, having an approved design of the storm drain system, including the, the stormwater treatment BMPs, uh, been issued a construction permit. Um, so it could be a grading permit or a building permit, but any, any sort of permit that authorized construction. And so those two both had to happen by February of 2016 in order to, to be grandfathered. Um, and then further, uh, the project had to begin construction within 180 days of that date. So basically, you have, you have to get your permit by February 2016 and then begin, begin construction within six months. And then for phased projects, um, they can retain that grandfathering as long as all subsequent permits are pulled within five years uh, of the effective date. So basically, unless your project has a permit already or is part of a larger phase project that has had permits pulled, your project won't be grandfathered and will need to comply with the, the new requirements generally. Can I get you to put this on? That way it'll be easier for you. Hey, is that? All right, okay. And this is a microphone right here? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay, good. <laughs> okay, uh, so, um, so, uh, so now we'll talk about the priority project defini definitions because these did uh, expand under the new permit to include more projects than uh, were previously included. Um, so there's a few different categories. Uh, so in order to be a priority development project, um, it includes a new development which creates 10,000 square feet or more of impervious area. Uh, redevelopment projects which create or replace 5,000 square feet of impervious area. And then uh, for certain types of development, uh, that 10,000 square foot uh, threshold is reduced down to 5,000 square feet. Uh, for projects that include restaurants, uh, hillside development, parking lots, streets, driveways, auto repair shops, and gas stations. Um, and then if you're adjacent to or drained to uh, an environmentally sensitive area, that is threshold is reduced further to 2,500 square feet. So for most projects, you know, which inc typically include a parking lot or a driveway of some sort, the, the threshold for being a priority development project is 5,000 square feet of impervious area. And so if you're a priority development project, then you need to comply with the design requirements in the BMP design manual. Okay, so now we'll uh, talk about some of the major changes uh, in the, the new MS4 permit. Um, and it uh, kind of falls into two main categories. Uh, as I mentioned before, water quality, or the new term for that is uh, pollutant control, um, as well as a hydro modification. Uh, so first we'll talk about pollutant control. Um, so there's some new concepts uh, in uh, the pollutant control section of the BMP design manual. Um, one is called the design capture volume. So this is the, the storm volume that we have to capture and, and treat uh, per the permit. And this used to be, we used to think of it as the, the first flush rainfall event, kind of these small frequent storms um, that produce the most pollutants. And so the design capture volume, or the DCV, uh, is sized based on the 24 hour 85th percentile storm event. So what that 85th percentile means is that 85% of all storms are that size or smaller. So if you capture the design capture volume, you're theoretically capturing 85% of all storm events um, in the region. And to give you an idea of uh, what kind of volumes we're talking about, uh, the 85th percentile storm event in downtown San Diego, for example, is a little over half an inch of rain. Um, and it varies throughout the county. It generally goes up the closer you get towards the mountains and, and the farther north you go. 
Uh, so for example, in uh, San Marcos, it's about 0 0.8 inches of rain. So it's a fairly sizable volume of, of water that we're talking about. Um, and in the calculation of the design capture volume, uh, it takes into account things like uh, your site area, uh, the runoff coefficient, your percent of impervious areas, and there's also, and your soil type as well, um, and there's also um, some reductions that are available through certain site design features, uh, such as uh, impervious area dispersion. So if you disperse your runoff into landscape areas, uh, if you have enough, if you do that enough, um, and there's ratios that you have to comply with, um, you can get a reduction in the design capture volume and therefore in the size of your BMPs by doing that. Um, other reductions can be had through uh, green roofs or permeable pavement, because those are basically treated as pervious areas uh, under the BMP design manual because they allow for uh, infiltration or absorption by the, by the soil. And there's also a reduction uh, through tree wells because um, it's been recognized that um, trees can intercept um, rainfall prior, to, prior to it hitting the water or prior to it hitting the ground um, and thereby reduce the, the amount of runoff. Um, so you can reduce your design capture volume uh, in certain cases by um, taking credit for the amount of trees you have on site. So you may have civil engineers start to come to you and ask for how, ma how many trees are on your, on your site, which they probably weren't interested in before. Um, so, uh, so once you calculate the design capture volume, you have to decide you know, what to do with it. How do we treat it on the site? Uh, and the permit and the BMP design manual um, kind of outline, I, I like to think of it as three different tiers uh, of, of treatment. Um, you're supposed to comply with uh, like the highest tr tier, essentially, that is feasible for your site. Um, and if not, then you can step down to the next tier. So the top tier and the, the preferred method of, of treatment uh, is on-site retention. So the idea of on-site retention is to implement LID or low impact development BMPs to retain 100% of the design capture volume on your site. Uh, now the term retain means that it can't leave your site so you don't have any runoff from the um, design capture volume size storms. Um, and so if it doesn't run off your site, well, you have to dispose of it on your site somehow. And so the, the way the methods the BMP design manual outline uh, as possible methods uh, for are uh, infiltration uh, into the soil or reuse uh, on your site. Um, and there's some feasibility criteria uh, within the BMP design manual, manual that allow you to assess whether or not it's, uh, it's feasible for your site to implement uh, retention BMPs, infiltration or, or reuse BMPs on your site. Now, unfortunately for San Diego County, um, a lot of our sites don't have very good infiltra infiltration characteristics due to the geotechnical conditions. You have a lot of clay soils or shallow bedrock, you know, steep, uh, large cut and fill slopes that um, geotechnical engineers don't want any infiltration near. So in a large percentage of projects, uh, infiltration will most likely be in, infeasible, but there will be some few sites where that is possible um, and where that's the preferred method for um, d disposal of the design, design capture volume. Um, and, and that determination will likely require uh, coordination with the uh, geotechnical engineer as well to determine what the infiltration rates are on the site, uh, may need site-specific infiltration testing, um, and determination of any other geological hazards to make sure that that infiltration is, is feasible um, on your site. Now for reuse, um, the BMP design manual um, talks about uh, two, two main reuse options. One is for landscape irrigation and the other is for um, toilet flushing, indoor reuse through uh, toilet flushing. And there's uh, again feasibility calculations in the BMP design manual to assess if it's feasible to do either of these options um, on your site. Um, one caveat is that um, the BMP design manual um, once instructs that the um, the design capture volume should be able to be used within 36 hours after a rainfall event um, in order to, for it to be feasible to reuse. Uh, and the reason for that is that, um, you know, in the winter, some years where we get, um, you know, storm event after storm event, um, a couple days apart, um, they want that design capture volume to be uh, disposed of before the next storm comes along so that you can capture the subsequent storm as well. So there's a 36 hour, um, guideline 
uh, for you to be able to re uh, dispose of the design capture volume on your site uh, before the next storm event comes. And so um, you probably realize that there's not much landscape irrigation demand within 36 hours of a storm event. So in uh, so for a lot of sites, um, landscape irrigation capture and reuse will not be feasible because there's not enough landscape irrigation demand uh, within 36 hours after a rainfall event. Now, if you still want to do uh, a capture and reuse system for irrigation to reduce your uh, water usage um, and you know possible lead credits and, and the like, uh, you can oversize uh, your stormwater capture system uh, to be able to make that um, happen. And then similarly for the toilet flushing, um, there they, the BMT design manual wants that volume to be used up within 36 hours. And uh, so the stormwater volumes are, are generally rather large uh, and the toilet vo flushing volumes are rather small. And so we've tested this out on a few different project types. Um, and uh, for most projects, it would show infeasible to be used within 36 hours. The types of projects where we're running into it, where it might be feasible, are mid-rise and high-rise projects, where you have a relatively small footprint project and a lot of toilet demand. Um, and so in, in those cases, it could pencil out to be feasible for um, capture and reuse uh, through toilet flushing or other indoor uh, uses as well. Okay, so that covers kind of the retention tier. Um, so if, you're, if it's infeasible to do either infiltration or capture and reuse on your site, then the next uh, preferred method um, is to implement biofiltration. So biofiltration is kind of a slightly new term for um, what we typically have thought of as bioretention basins or flow through planters, rain gardens, those sorts of BMPs, which we've been seeing for several years now. Um, so it's not, not an entirely new concept. Um, there are some new sizing requirements uh, for biofiltration um, you know, based on the design capture volume calculations. And the good news is in that some cases it, it, the sizing can actually go down. Like the old rule of thumb for the minimum size of a biofiltration or bioretention basin was 4% of the impervious area on your site. The, in, under the new BMP design manual, in many cases that can be reduced down to 3%. And a, a new concept or a new option on the table under the new stormwater permit uh, is the concept of alternative compliance. So alternative compliance um, is kind of like offsite mitigation for stormwater. So the idea is that you still have to do some degree of treatment on your site. So you implement uh, flow through treatment control BMPs on your site and perform an alter offsite alternative compliance mitigation. Uh, so talk a little bit more about the alternative compliance option. Um, so like I said, the, the idea is generally that it's off-site water quality or hydro modification management projects that offset kind of the impacts due to your project on site. And the idea is that it provides a greater overall water quality benefit to the watershed than if you simply implemented the permit requirements on your site. And so the county and the other co-permittees uh, have developed a water quality equivalency criteria that allows you to calculate essentially how much offsite mitigation you need to do to offsite the impacts to your project. And that calculation continue, uh, considers factors such as land use uh, and pollutant loadings and BMP effectiveness, both of your, your on-site project and the location of your offsite alternative compliance project. And uh, eventually, um, there'll be two options for alternative compliance. Either the, uh, the project will be able to construct it themselves or contribute funding to a regional alternative compliance project. Um, the applicant initiated alternative compliance um, can be proposed now under the BMP design manual and the water quality equivalency um, criteria. But the credit and fee-based systems um, are still under development. And our best guess is they're another one and a half to two years out. Um, and I think that's going to be a, an attractive option for a lot of developers, but um, again, that's probably one and a half to two years out. The applicant proposed alternative compliance projects. Uh, we haven't seen any of those come through yet. Um, I'm curious to see how it works out because there are, there are some, some hurdles as far as maintenance and, uh, and such um, to uh, determine how that will work out. 
Okay, so that basically covers the major changes under the water quality uh, portion. Uh, so now we'll talk about hydro modification. Uh, first off, what is hydro modification? It's still a relatively new term, so not everybody's um, familiar with it. Uh, so hydro modification is uh, increased erosion in soft bottom streams and channels that is the result of development. And uh, these impacts have been attributed to uh, increased flow magnitudes and durations uh, on small to medium sized rainfall events. So if you take a natural site and uh, construct a project on it at some impervious surface, you know, roof or parking lot or pavement, um, when it rains, you're going to have higher flow rates, um, and those flow rates are going to last for a longer period of time than they would in, in, the norm, in the existing condition. And that can cause erosion and degradation of the downstream channels. And so the idea of hydro modification mitigation is to keep channels at the top looking like the top and not like the picture at the bottom. Um, and so the rainfall events of concern um, are uh, from a percentage of the two-year storm up to the 10-year storm. So it's the medium, small to medium-sized rain events that cause the most er erosion within channels. So under the pollutant control and water quality considerations, we're looking at these small, frequent rainfall events. For hydro modification, we're looking at the small and medium-sized rainfall events. And of course, we as civil engineers also have to look at the, the peak storm event, the 50-year or the 100-year storm event, um, to ensure there isn't flooding. So really, we're at a point now where we have to look at the entire spectrum of, of rainfall events to make sure there are no adverse effects. Um, you know, one thing to note on hydro modification is that there are some exemptions available. Um, projects that, uh, including uh, projects that discharge directly to uh, the ocean, uh, bays, or major rivers, uh, particularly the lower section of major rivers, um, those are generally exempt from hydro modification impacts because um, the idea of hydro modification mitigation is to protect natural streams and channels. So if your project doesn't discharge to a natural stream or channel, then you don't have to protect it. Uh, so if your project discharges directly to the ocean, you're exempt from hydro modification. And the way you do hydro modification mitigation is to basically uh, detain water on your site and release it at a slow, non-erosive rate. Uh, so it leads to larger BMPs generally. Uh, so the major changes uh, under the hydro modification requirements, uh, there's two main areas. Uh, one is that um, mainly, mainly impacts redevelopment projects, and that's that post-project flows under the new permit must not exceed pre-development flows rather than pre-project flows. Now that may sound like semantics, but Pre-development means before the, project, the site was ever developed in the first place. So this means for redevelopment projects, there's no longer a credit for existing impervious areas. So under the old permit, um, a project could get credit for existing impervious areas or potentially even be exempt from hydro mod requirements if they were reducing the overall imperviousness of a site. Uh, but now that exemption no, uh, no longer holds uh, and you don't get any credit for existing impervious areas. And so that means that re redevelopment projects must implement flow controls to match uh, the conditions of an undeveloped site. So this means larger BMPs and larger detention sy systems potentially for um, redevelopment projects primarily. So another uh, change in the, in, the, in the new requirements under hydro modification is the introduction of something called the protection of critical coarse sediment yield areas. So this is a, a new concept that was introduced in the, the, the permit. Um, and the basic idea is that naturally occurring sediment is beneficial to receiving streams and beaches. So under natural conditions, a certain amount of erosion occurs within the upstream reaches of a watershed. And that erosion, that sediment that's generated is deposited in the, the receiving streams. Some of it makes it down to the beaches and replenishes the beaches. And so in order to maintain an equilibrium in these streams and channels, you have to maintain uh, those sediment producing areas. Um, and so the, the county and the co-permittees did a, a regional mapping effort um, to identify where these uh, critical coarse sediment yield areas are. And it's generally areas with coarse uh, soils, uh, so like um, sandy or, or rocky soils, um, and then steeper areas that will generate erosion during a rainfall event, 
And they also considered um, vegetation cover, because certain vegetations allow sediment to pass through while others capture it. Um, and so if these critical core sediment yield areas are present on your site, um, they must be either avoided or mitigated. Um, and uh, some good progress was made in the final months of the uh, BM development of the BMP design manual to uh, develop a mitigation uh, strategy uh, for critical core sediment yield areas. Um, this is one of the last pieces of the BMP design manual to fall into place, and I'm really glad it did. Um, the mitigation uh, calculations focus on showing uh, no net impact to receiving waters. So if you're impacting these critical core sediment yield areas, essentially what you need to do is detain more water on your site so you're reducing your erosion potential as well to offset that loss of sediment. Um, and so with that, I'll show the map. Um, so this has sometimes been referred to as the rash map. So this is uh, the kind of regional mapping effort of the uh, critical core sediment yield areas uh, throughout the county. Um, so as you can see, it impacts, uh, is a potential impact to a lot of the undeveloped areas of the county. Uh, the good news is um, through development of that uh, mitigation criteria, um, it, it, it's potentially manageable uh, for, for a lot of projects. Um, and the county has also linked this requirement to their RPO steep slopes um, ordinance. Uh, so um, in the county, if you're complying with the RPO steep slopes requirements, they consider that um, com compliance with the uh, critical core sediment yield areas as well. So there's a couple, few, a couple good options that have been developed uh, for managing these critical core sediment yield area impacts. Okay, so now I'll offer some solutions and types of BMPs that you might be seeing on projects uh, to implement uh, these design requirements uh, of the new permit. Um, so under the retention category, um, there's basically two options, capture and reuse or infiltration. Capture and reuse can be through irrigation or indoor, uh, such as toilet flushing reuse. Infiltration BMPs can take uh, quite a few different forms. Uh, bioretention basins without a subdrain, so a true bioretention basin that retains the, the water within it and allows it to infiltrate uh, is considered uh, infiltration BMP. So if, you're, um, if your soils can accept that um, infiltration and you don't need a subdrain, subdrain within your bioretention basin, that can qualify as infiltration. I can also have infiltration basins or, or infiltration trenches. Uh, underground vaults can be designed with a, potentially with an open bottom to allow for infiltration into the soils below. Uh, and then dry wells could be an option for some sites as well that have a relatively small footprint and can infiltrate water uh, into the soil below. So under biofiltration, uh, you can have biofiltration basins, which we've been seeing on a lot of projects uh, the last few years. These can also be uh, constructed above ground and above ground planter boxes uh, for more urban projects. Um, and potentially uh, proprietary high-rate biofiltration units. These are units such as uh, Filtera or modular wetlands. Um, that the BMP design manual kind of left a door open for these to be implemented in certain circumstances. It's kind of left up under the uh, up to the discretion of the jurisdiction, though. Uh, so it's not like you're going to be able to propose these on all projects and they'll cover you. I think it's only going to be in certain circumstances where you're really constrained on what, what your other options are. Um, and then uh, if you're doing al alternative compliance, uh, you still need to do some level of treatment on your site. Uh, so things like downspout filters, hydrodynamic separators, media filters, kind of the old school black box treatment devices um, that we used to use quite a lot, but they're, they don't quite cut it anymore unless you're doing alternative compliance as, as well. Okay, now some examples uh, of these uh, in the field and some design, uh, some, some notes on them. Uh, so biofiltration basins, uh, the general idea is there are shallow depressions in the landscape area that are designed to capture runoff, uh, allow that runoff to pond and then filter through uh, soil media below. Um, and then uh, typically there's a gravel subdrain layer. If you're allowed to, if you can infiltrate, then you don't need a subdrain. If you can't infiltrate, 
Uh, you do need a subdrain generally, and sometimes an, an impermeable liner as well. In many cases, the geotechnical engineer uh, requires an impermeable liner uh, as well. Uh, and the reason this is one of the preferred treatment methods in the BMP design manual and the MS4 permit is that it's effective for a wide range of pollutants. It's very, um, it's a, it incorporates natural tr cleaning processes um, and uh, does a good job at re um, removing pollutants. And these basins can be easily incorporated into uh, the landscape areas of your site. Uh, you know, parking lot islands and edges, uh, you know, streets right away, potentially in the parkway strip along a street or in the median if you have a, an inverted crown. Um, and then landscape areas uh, around the building is, as well. And to give you some uh, idea of rule of thumb sizing uh, for these units, uh, if you have to do water quality treatment and hydro modification, the size can vary from about 6 to 16 percent of the impervious area on your site. The reason it varies so much is that uh, there's some, so, several factors that go into uh, come into play when you're determining your hydromod requirements, um, such as soil type, slope, um, and you can do uh, something called a channel assessment to look at your downstream receiving channel and see how susceptible it is to erosion. Uh, so that's why there's such a big variance there. Um, and if you're doing it for treatment only, say if you're exempt from hydro modification or you're dealing with your hydro mod some, in some other way, um, then the footprint of these uh, biofiltration basins can be uh, reduced to about 3% of the impervious area on your site. Uh, now another potential solution that may, we may be seeing more um, are detention vaults. Um, these can be pretty flexible depending on how they're designed. Uh, they can be configured with re retention. Um, if, um, if, uh, if your site allows for infiltration, you can design these with an open bottom so that the, the vault would capture the runoff and then sort of slowly in infiltrate into the, the soil below. Um, or it can be used as a cistern with a, a bio, uh, reuse system for either landscape irrigation or um, indoor reuse. And, and it could be potentially uh, integrated with uh, biofiltration as well. So if you can do, if you can only provide 3% of your site for biofiltration, but you need to do hydro modification as well, you can do the treatment within the 3% biofiltration area and then you know, uh, do your hydro mod storage in an underground vault um, to reduce the amount of surface area that you need to use for your BMPs. So the, the tension vaults alone do not provide uh, pollutant control treatment, so it needs to be done in combination with either retention, infiltration, or, or biofiltration. Um, and uh, the bonus of these is that they can be installed under uh, other, uh, other surface improvements, so you're not devoting portions of your site solely to stormwater treatment. And it can be installed under parking lots, streets, or, or landscape areas to allow you to maximize your property usage. Um, and then as some rule of thumb sizing for a typical um, four foot deep vault, the, the footprint of, uh, of that vault for hydro mod storage would be about two to 10% of the impervious area on your site. Okay, now some tips on how to plan uh, for a new project to um, uh, you know, make sure these stormwater treatment um, components are integrated into the site. Um, you know, first off, consider your timeline. Will the project be subject to the new BMP design requirements? Most likely, yes, unless it's uh, already permitted or part of a larger phase project. Uh, check for hydro modification exemptions. Um, like I mentioned, the redevelopment exemption is no longer available, but um, if you discharge directly to the ocean, uh, the bay or uh, one of the major rivers in the county, uh, you may still be exempt. Um, I think projects uh, are going to need to in involve the geotechnical engineer uh, quite a bit more uh, early on in the planning process um, to determine if infiltration is feasible for the site. Um, and that may include infiltration testing on the site. Um, you know, look at your opportunities for reuse. Do you have a large landscape area? where uh, you could, could use the irrigation water. Um, you know, are you going for lead credits? There are some lead credits available for stormwater reuse as well. So those may be factors that uh, push you towards uh, doing a uh, capture and reuse system. Um, is alternative compliance worth exploring? If you have a very constrained site, that may be a, a good option for you. 
Um, and it's going to be increasingly important to identify the stormwater strategy early on and uh, integrate it into the site planning efforts so you're not finding out down the road that you need to devote 16% of your site to a biofiltration basin. Nobody wants that to, to find that out later. Um, and, and it will allow you to account for BMP costs uh, in your site development budgets uh, early on as well, because some of these features can be quite uh, expensive as well. Okay, so that's uh, it for my portion. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, my contact information is up there on the screen. Um, feel free to reach out with any uh, questions you may have, um, or should, should I open it up for questions now? Or? Yeah, we can take a few questions. We have plenty of time for that, but then there will be a larger question and answer session at the end. Right. Yeah, quick question. Are you going to make these slides available on our website anywhere? They're really great. I'd love to see them refer to them later. Sure. Yeah, those are all the um, slides will be available on the stewardship website, so it's ASLASanDiego.com, uh, and their video will also be available for the presentation. Okay, anything else? Sure. So for cities um, designing new streets or existing streets, if there's are they going to have to adhere as well to all of these new stormwater water regulations? And how are they going to put that in? <laughs> to have a very narrow roadway or That's a very good question. Um, yes, they, they will have to uh, integrate these. There are some limited exemptions for if you're just installing a, a sidewalk, I believe, um, then it can be exempt. But if you're doing a new sidewalk and new curb and a, and a widening, then, then you need to comply with these. Um, there is also uh, an exemption for uh, streets that are designed with uh, Green Street guidance. Um, so if you're, the county uh, has published a, a Green Street standards uh, manual as part of the, the BMP design manual. And if you design, if the street is designed in compliance with that, um, then it can be exempt from the uh, numerics, I guess the numeric BMP sizing criteria, but you still need to integrate, you know, LID and BMPs within the, the, the Green Street for that to, to qualify as well. <laughs> That's a very good question as well. Uh, within, uh, and, and it's kind of a site-specific issue. Um, the, the, I mean, it is an issue. Like the depth of the soil layer within the biofiltration basins can be varied, um, assuming you have sufficient depth available in your storm drain system to allow for deeper uh, root, um, root volumes. Um, but the, the biofiltration soil media as well um, is not something that's particularly conducive for, for, for plant growth. Um, it's a high infiltration uh, soil um, that, and there's a specification for that soil in the BMP design manual. Um, so, um, you know, that needs to be taken into account as well in, in selecting uh, nitrate, tree, and plant material. I'm always impacting my tail around it by the barometer. Uh, yeah, the general um, maintenance guidelines say that in five, five to ten years, the, the soil media needs to be uh, maintained. Um, and that's basically driven by uh, observation of, of clogging and, and standing water. So if it stops perking, then you know, the soil um, media has been, become clogged and needs to be renewed. Um, so yeah, that is, that is a concern going long term. Okay, uh, well, I'll be available uh, at the end of the presentation for questions as well. <laughs>